In this video, we're going to talk about reabsorption in the nephron. Hey, what's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. So last video, we talked about filtration, but today we're going to take a look at the second part of the process in urine formation, and that is reabsorption. We're going to look at how reabsorption occurs and talk about something called the renal threshold and saturation. And as always, we're going to have a clinical application and see how this process relates to diabetes. So make sure you stay tuned till the end. Now grab the most caffeinated and sugary drink you have and let's get started. So reabsorption refers to fluid and substances inside the nephron moving back into our circulation. So after fluid gets filtered at the Bowman's capsule, it has to get reabsorbed later on. Otherwise, we would just filter all of our blood and not have any blood left to use. So 99% of filtered fluid is actually reabsorbed. Now most of this reabsorption takes place in the proximal tubules, although some reabsorption does take place in the distal nephron. Okay, so reabsorption can be an active or a passive process. Because the concentration of the filtrate is the same as the concentration in the extracellular space or the plasma, active transport has to occur to get substances from the filtrate back into the plasma. So sodium is one of those substances that has to be actively transported, and the reabsorption of sodium is what actually drives the reabsorption of most other substances in the nephron. Okay, so when we look at this diagram, Notice that there is the tubule on one side, that's the nephron, and then a capillary on the other side. But in between these, there are tubular cells, and these tubular cells line the nephron, and they separate the tubule of the nephron from the capillary. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, sodium will flow passively from the tubule lumen into the tubular cell and it flows passively into the cell because there is a higher concentration of sodium in the lumen than there is inside the cell. But once it gets into the cell, that's a completely different story. Now sodium has to go from a lower concentration inside the cell to a higher concentration inside the plasma. There's good news though. We have a little friend to help us. And that friend is the sodium potassium ATPase. And this pump transfers three sodium ions into the plasma for every two potassium ions that it brings into the cell. Then, so that the potassium does not build up inside the cell, it actually leaks back out through a channel on the side of the cell that's next to the plasma. Okay, now let's talk about something called a sodium glucose symporter. So things like glucose, amino acids, and other ions can actually piggyback on sodium in order to get carried to the plasma. And we'll look at this specifically with glucose. So glucose uses sodium, which is flowing down its concentration gradient to get into the tubular cell. Then once glucose is in the cell, it can passively flow into the capillaries through a GLUT protein mediated transporter since the concentration of glucose is higher in the cell than in the plasma. In this case, sodium will again use the sodium potassium ATPase to get out of the cell. And again, potassium will flow back out to the plasma through a leak channel. Okay, so the last mechanism of transport that I want to look at is transcytosis. Okay. So transcytosis occurs when macromolecules that are too big to just go across the cell themselves are engulfed in these little sacs on one side of the cell. They are transported in this sac across the cell and then ejected from the cell on the other side. Now in the kidneys, there's a modified transcytosis that occurs with plasma proteins. So some plasma proteins can actually get filtered at the Bowman's capsule. And even though these proteins pass through the filtration barrier, they're still too big to be reabsorbed through channels. So what happens is that these proteins are engulfed 
and then in the cell they are digested by lysosomes and then released on the other end as amino acids into the capillary. Now let's talk about a concept known as saturation. So how many substances are reabsorbed back into the plasma depends upon how many transporters we have to carry these substances. Once every single transporter or carrier is occupied by a substance slash substrate, we call this saturation. But like we said earlier, 99% of what is filtered is reabsorbed. So we are trying to reabsorb pretty much everything. So our transporters, they work really hard. So up until the point that we reach saturation, the transport rate, so the amount of substance that we transport in a minute, that's what we mean by transport rate, is directly related to the concentration of that substance in the plasma. But after we hit the saturation point, the transport rate is maxed out. And the term for this is transport maximum. And what it means is that any increase in a concentration of this substance will not increase the reabsorption. So everything else goes to be excreted as urine since we can't reabsorb it. Now, one last term that we need to talk about is a renal threshold. And renal threshold is just the plasma concentration at which saturation occurs. Okay, now to illustrate these topics, let's take the example of glucose because, well, I love sugar. Okay, well, I do love sugar, but that's not why we're gonna talk about it. It's actually because glucose has a clinical application here. So at normal plasma glucose levels, all the glucose that enters the nephron is reabsorbed before it reaches the end of the proximal tubule. But in the case of diabetes, blood sugar levels are out of control and glucose is filtered faster than it could be reabsorbed. All the transporters get saturated with glucose, but as long as it's moving through the nephron, glucose doesn't stop to wait in line for a next available transporter. It keeps moving and it will get excreted in the urine. The plasma concentration at which glucose first shows up in the urine is called the renal threshold for glucose. And the transport rate at which glucose has saturated all of the carriers is called the transport maximum. Okay, so under normal conditions, all the glucose that gets filtered also gets reabsorbed. So filtration of glucose will also equal reabsorption. It's only when renal threshold is exceeded that glucose will spill over into the urine. Okay, so when glucose spills over into the urine, we call this glucose urea. And there's really only two conditions where glucose urea occurs. It can occur if your blood sugar gets really high, like in the case of diabetes, or when I told you to drink that really sugary drink at the start of this lesson, no, I'm actually just kidding. It will really only happen with diabetes. Or it can happen if you have a genetic condition where your nephron doesn't make enough glucose carriers. Now, one last thing before we close. So we talked earlier about how ions and metabolic products use transporters to move things across membranes from the filtrate into the plasma. Filtered fluid, however, moves by way of osmosis. And the reason that it can do this is because the capillaries surrounding the nephron have a very low hydrostatic pressure. Their hydrostatic pressure is actually lower than the 55 millimeters of mercury that we saw in the glomerulus. Hey guys, welcome back. I know that reabsorption can get a little confusing with all the transporters and ions. So if you have any questions, feel free to comment down below. If you got value out of this video, then go ahead and hit that like button. And if you know that it could help somebody else, go ahead and share it with them. Otherwise, don't forget to subscribe. Keep learning and I'll see you guys next video.